Um, before I start moving through my slides, let me just give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of my thinking about imagination at earlier points in time. So as Tony just mentioned, I published a book in 2000 called The Work of the Imagination. And in that book, I talked initially about the older Piagetian assumption that children's imagination and fantasy was something that gradually waned as their um, increasing um, objectivity, so to speak, suppressed their tendency to fantasize. So that was a very simple developmental model where you have the child being somewhat wayward and fanciful and imaginative. And then as time goes on in the course of cognitive development, the imagination gets overridden as the child becomes more objective. In my book, the 2000 book, I argue that that picture is radically wrong and that the imagination uh, plays a continuing contribution um, throughout uh, childhood and into adulthood um, <clears throat> in the sense that it helps us with causal thinking, moral judgment, counterfactual thinking. I won't rehearse um, all the, the aspects of that particular book, but one of the things that's emerged um, in the last, gosh, two decades in my own mind is the fact that although there were hints in the book, the 2000 book, that children's imagination is also grounded in reality. In other words, it, it doesn't depart too far from reality. <clears throat> that was a theme that I didn't really elaborate. And that's the theme that I would like to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to argue that although we're often tempted to think of children as richly imaginative, and in certain ways they are, uh, that's to say, they do spend a lot of time in an imaginary world. I want to argue that the imaginary world that they spend time in is very close to, not very different from, the real world in very many important uh, ways. And actually that's in many ways a good thing because it means that when they use their imagination to think about possibilities, um, the possibilities that they think about are plausible possibilities, they're realistic possibilities, rather than fantastical possibilities. Um, so I need to go on to my next slide. Here we go. So I'm going to tell you about five uh, manifestations of this tendency, this reality grounded um, imagination, pretend play, imagining the future, judging what's possible, uh, tool making and uh, drawing. Let's get started with um, pretend play. So this is an old study um, that figured in the 2000 book, um, but I think it illustrates an important point about pretend play, namely the way in which the child uses their own knowledge to understand what's going on. So in this case, the child was watching an adult play partner and uh, depending on which group they were in, children saw this partner pick up a milk carton and pretend to pour milk from the carton into a container. And then the container uh, was carried over and, uh, to a toy horse, turned upside down with the implication that the contents of the container uh, fell down on the horse. So that was one group of children. Another group of children saw roughly the same thing, except that it wasn't a milk carton. It was a can of um, talcum powder that was shaken into the container. And again, the container was then carried over to the toy horse, turned upside down, and the contents uh, um, uh, uh, left uh, poured onto the, onto the toy horse. And at this point, we could ask the child a very simple question. And our, um, what we were looking for was the extent to which children in these two groups would give different answers. Now, if you think about it for a moment, that second maneuver of tipping the container upside down is gonna look absolutely identical for the two groups. It's an empty container with make-believe contents, but the make-believe contents are of course invisible. So how did the children answer? Well, one group said the house was now wet or milky or got milk on, covered in milk. The other group, taking into account the fact that it was talcum powder and not milk, said the horse was dry, powdery, got powder on him, covered in powder. <clears throat> 
So just to emphasize, here we're seeing the way in which children draw on their understanding of the, what happens to a liquid when you pour it, it descends into the surface beneath. When you invert a container, the contents of the container will pour out. Those contents, of course, will not go laterally. They will not go <coughs> up into the air. They will descend and they will cover the nearest surface, which in this case, of course, was eventually the horse. So all of that, as it were, naive physics is imported into the child's understanding of that pretend episode. I could tell you more about pretend comprehension or the children, the way children make sense of a play partner. Um, but let me um, turn to pretend production um, and just summarize pretend comprehension here. So children's early comprehension of a play partner's pretend actions involves the transposition of their understanding of real world regularities. Okay. So if we turn now to not what the child understands, but what the child produces, a very nice review back in 1984 by Inga Bretherton concluded as follows. The content of early pretending is drawn from and reproduces the infant's everyday experience, sleeping, eating, telephoning, going for a ride and so forth. And I just want to emphasize the fact that this disposition is a universal one. So, in the last 20, 30 years, there have been lots of studies of spontaneous pretend play in different parts of the world, and they tell roughly the same story. Let me just give you one illustration of what happens when we go to radically different culture. So this was a study done recently by Adam Boyette in the Congo Basin um, uh, rainforest of the CAR. He watched two groups, Aka children and Nagandu children. And um, what he found was that these children were spending a good portion of their day, three or four hours per day, engaged in play. Some of this was sort of rough and tumble play, chasing play, climbing trees and so forth. But some of it was indeed uh, pretend play, about 20%. So what was the content of that pretend play? Ah, here's a picture of, this was a time sampling study so that meant that Adam was uh, running after these children to see what they did and here he's taking a well-earned rest. So what was the content of their uh, pretend play? Well again it was enactments of everyday activities, fetching water, cooking in edible leaves, um, shotgun hunting, digging with a machete, emulating their parents. Um, so again, we see um, evidence that when children produce pretend play, um, departures from everyday life are very rare. Uh, children reenact familiar everyday activities rather than creating a fantastical world. And in fact, some studies have uh, counted up the number of times that a child invents or enacts, so to speak, a monster. Um, or pretends to be a non-existent animal, and they are extremely rare. Um, so in some sense then, if you think about children as novelists, they're in the genre of uh, fictional realism rather than magical realism or science fiction. Okay, so here's my summary of early pretend play infused with knowledge of reality. Now let's talk about imagining the future. So you could say, well, I'm undercutting the imagination here. I'm, I'm, I'm being rather negative and withholding. Um, but let me emphasize the following point. If we draw on our understanding of the past, of reality, to engage in an important function of the imagination, namely to think about what's going to happen in the future, it's probably a good idea for us to draw on reality rather than to fantasize about magical possibilities. So in other words, a tendency to fantasize uh, would be less accurate for anticipating what the future holds than um, uh, drawing on the imagination, provided the imagination itself is attuned to prior regularities in everyday life. <laughs> 
So there's some fascinating work done with adults, which shows that there's a deep connection between remembering the past and imagining the future. More specifically, if we look at adults with memory problems and adults with various forms of amnesia and ask them to envision a future possibility or plan for a future experience, it turns out that they suffer in that regard too. So in other words, amnesic patients do not just have memory problems, they have uh, future planning problems. And indeed, if we uh, ask normal adults um, about future events, um, they'll do better when they envision these future events occurring in a fairly recent familiar setting, um, a college campus, for example, rather than a more remote setting. So whether we're talking about adults with brain damage or normal adults, we see this close link between memory for the past and um, planning for the future, envisioning the future. So I took a look at the literature in childhood, which is much more limited, and we certainly don't have studies of young children with amnesia, but what we do see is a close link between the richness with which children can remember the past and the richness with which they can envision the future. So even if we control for age and verbal ability, we find that the child who talks in more detail about the past is the same child as the one who talks in more detail with greater richness about the future. So imagining the future then, uh, closely linked to remembering the past. And when I say the past, I mean the real past as opposed to an imaginary past. So now I'm going to talk about not imagining the future, but making judgments about what could happen in the future, differentiating between what could really truly happen and what is impossible. And one of the um, most interesting studies in this domain, pioneering study, was done by Andrew Stuhlman and Susan Carey uh, back in 2007. <clears throat> and they gave young children um, three, and indeed they had, they tested adults as well, three different types of events to think about. Things that are perfectly possible, eating an apple. Things that are impossible, walking through a brick wall. <clears throat> and things that are unlikely, but nonetheless uh, possible. And the children work through a storybook with depictions of these various kinds of events, possible, impossible, and improbable. Um, here's, for example, um, one impossible event and one um, improbable event. So here's a child waking up in the morning and finding an alligator under his bed, which, which the subjects ought to be judging to be not impossible, um, admittedly unlikely, but nonetheless um, possible. And of course, on the right hand side, we see um, the boy having lunch, um, having lightning for dinner, and um, that's to be judged impossible. That defies the laws of physics. So what did Stuhlman and Carey find? So he, the results were extremely um, clear and straightforward. So if you look at the red line, you see that at four years, six years, eight years among adults, um, most subjects are saying, yes, those ordinary events, eating an apple, they're perfectly possible. And I look at the green line, and there you'll see that those impossible events, having lightning for dinner, walking through a brick wall, and so forth, they're all judged impossible at all ages. What's really interesting, though, is the blue line, that improbable line. And there we see that four-year-olds make the mistake of saying, no, you could never find an alligator under your bed. Some six-year-olds um, are somewhat better at that. And of course, among adults, we see um, virtually perfect accuracy where they realize that certain events, albeit unlikely, are not impossible. So here's a quick summary of those findings. <clears throat> 
So how can we explain these findings? I think a plausible explanation is that <clears throat> children rely on their imagination to make judgments. So asked whether something is possible, they, so to speak, try to en envisage that event happening. And in drawing on their imagination, their, if their imagination is tied to reality, it might show certain restrictions. But, so let's work through three examples. Asked if someone could eat an apple, I would say they can easily imagine someone doing that. They've seen it lots of times. <clears throat> so they correctly judge it to be possible. Conversely, asked if someone could walk through a brick wall, they try to construct an appropriate mental representation in their imagination, but given their previous experience with the solidity of brick walls, um, they fail in their imagination. And so using their imagination, they say, no, that, that couldn't happen. But now we come to the interesting case. If they're asked if someone could find an alligator under their bed, they again attempt to construct an appropriate representation, but recall that their past experience with things under beds is unlikely to include alligators. So when they construct um, a mental representation of a boy waking up, looking under his bed, no doubt they can envisage him seeing his slippers um, or his book, but they won't envision him seeing an alligator. Given that failure of the imagination, they come to the conclusion that this is impossible. Uh, nobody could wake up and find an alligator under their bed. So that heuristic strategy of relying on the imagination helps children to correctly judge what's possible, to correctly judge what's impossible. But as you saw, it leads to uh, marked errors for improbable events. Um, children are effectively misled by their limited imagination into deciding that something that is actually technically possible within the laws of physics, but could not happen ordinarily. There's more to say, I, there's more to say about the developmental improvement on those, um, on those improbable events. Um, and I'll return to that briefly at the end of the talk. But for the moment, let's just live with the fact that um, children's limited imagination they're drawing on what they know to be, have happened in the past, is a good account of their difficulties in, um, in judging correctly that something that's improbable or unlikely could nonetheless happen. Okay, so judging what is possible, my summary here, um, their judgments are error prone, <clears throat> they're conservative, um, particularly given children's limited imagination, they make lots of mistakes about the improbable. Okay, now I'm going to turn then to innovation and tool manufacture. Let me just say an introductory word about this. Um, as developmental psychologists and um, more evolutionary minded uh, psychologists have put their heads together. Um, interesting questions have arisen about how it is that we humans rely so much on tools and the extent to which we are good at manufacturing tools and the extent to which we are good at copying somebody else who's made a tool and using it appropriately. And in that context, um, namely the context of, as it were, man, the creative tool user, um, questions have been asked about the extent to which young children are also good at not just tool using, but tool invention. And I'm going to tell you about some studies which are surprisingly uniform uh, in saying, well, actually, young children are not very good at tool creation, tool manufacture. So let me tell you about this uh, study by Sarah Beck and colleagues. Um, the children were uh, shown um, a sticker, which was in a tiny bucket, and the bucket was at the uh, bottom of a narrow plastic cylinder. <clears throat> 
And the children were invited to try to lift the bucket from the bottom of the cylinder so that they could win the sticker. And uh, the, the uh, experimenters uh, gave the children two tools to choose from. Um, they could either use a straight pipe cleaner or one with a hook on the end. And you won't be surprised to learn that most children were quite good at this simple choice. Most of the children picked up the hooked pipe cleaner, poked it down the tube, hooked the bucket, lifted the bucket out and won the sticker. However, in a follow-up um, experiment, life was made a bit more complicated. The children were given um, the choice between a straight pipe cleaner, so it doesn't have a hook on the end, and a piece of string, and they were asked to use those materials to extract the sticker. So what happened under these circumstances what, was that many children, even though they'd shown in the previous study the ability to use a hooked pipe cleaner, failed to realize that all they needed to do to again win the sticker, I should explain of course this is a different group of children, um, to win the sticker all they needed to do was to uh, pick up the pipe cleaner, make a hook at the end and again put it down into the tube um, and retrieve the bucket. <clears throat> so Almost none of the three to five year olds managed to do this and fewer than half of the five to seven year olds succeeded. Here's the developmental graph with those black bars <coughs> illustrating the steady increase in the ability to simply bend the pipe cleaner hook. The gray bars here, you can ignore those were um, alternative solutions that a few of the older children came up with. You might ask whether this problem uh, shown by these children who were tested in the UK um, might be overcome by children who, so to speak, um, live in surroundings which are more demanding um, and more demanding in the sense that there are fewer ready-made uh, ready artifacts available. And this was the question that Mark Nielsen asked, um, working both in Australia, in Brisbane, um, and also uh, in um, South Africa, testing Bushman children. And the Brisbane children were living in um, town, uh, <coughs> um, in the town of Brisbane. So they were, it was an urban center and they had access to the kinds of toys that urban children have. Whereas the Bushman children, um, as Nielsen and colleagues emphasize, lack prefabricated toys. So the idea was that maybe these children, um, thrown back on their own resources for making toys, would be more inventive in this problem solving situation. Here's a, here's a so to speak, a, 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 a locally manufactured toy, or at least a combination of, of um, stick and tire being used to engage in a play activity. So essentially Nielsen and colleagues reconducted the tube task with the sticker in the small bucket um, in Brisbane and among the Bushman children with the expectation that the Bushman children would do better than the Brisbane children. They didn't find that. First of all, only 6% of the children presented with a straight pipe cleaner made a hook out of it. Um, whereas uh, children who watched a demonstrator bend the pipe cleaner to make a hook um, were very good at copying this action and solving, solving the problem. And in both of these respects, the dearth of children spontaneously bending the hook and the plenitude or a majority of children successfully doing so after a demonstration. The figures were similar in Brisbane and um, among the Bushman children. So to sum up, both groups of children were poor innovators, uh, poor creators, but they were very good uh, copiers. <clears throat> 
So summarizing those results, young children are very good at copying and this echoes lots of work um, done recently on the issue of so-called over imitation. Young children watch a demonstration, um, complete it very faithfully and sometimes uh, even introduce elements which strictly speaking are not functional when they see somebody using a tool. Um, on the other hand, if they're not given a demonstration and if the solution depends on their own spontaneous tool innovation, few younger children are successful. And as I've emphasized, we're not talking about a Western difficulty or deficit, nor indeed um, a difficulty or deficit um, that's overcome in the third world or manifests itself in the third world. It seems to be a universal problem for young children. We're saying a little bit more about why it's such a problem and my own interpretation of what's going on here, um, borrowing from Sarah Beck and her colleagues, is that the child faced with the straight pipe cleaner is effectively faced with a sort of open-ended task of trying to pin down what might be a suitable instrument. In other words, the child has to think to himself or herself, let me see what among the various tools out there in the world might serve the purpose here. And to zoom in on something with a hook on. And my guess is that the demonstrations show to the child that what is needed here is a hook. So once that, um, once that narrowing of the problem is achieved, the task of creating the hook is pretty straightforward. More generally, I think that, of course, as children get older, they'll be exposed to a more and more rich repertoire of tools, artifacts in their culture. And um, among those uh, that they're exposed to will be hooks. So in other words, um, knowing what is needed in a given open-ended situation becomes less of a problem for them. So in other words, um, what is an open-ended problem becomes a more closed problem in which it's not so much a question of what should I use, but I know what I should use, but how do I reproduce it? How do I make a hook? Okay. So innovation tool manufacture, rare in young children unless prompted and demonstrated. So finally, I'm going to talk about children's drawing. So those of you who um, are interested in children's drawing will know that a great proportion of the research has focused on what we might think of as the development of their figurative skills. By that I mean we give the child the task of drawing a table with some objects on it or we give the child the task of drawing um, a cup um, and we study the extent to which <clears throat> younger children as compared to older children can handle the difficult problem of representing what is effectively a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional surface. Those of you who are interested in this problem may rem well remember the very beautiful work of John Willits, um, an art educator in the UK, who studied the stages that children go through precisely in drawing objects on a table. And I remember thinking um, about the younger children who would draw the objects on the table, but since their table was typically a straight line from the left side of the page to the right side of the page, um, with no surface, so to speak, they struggled in getting the objects on the table and the objects were typically floating above the table. That was, of course, the children were not trying to depict floating objects, but their figurative skills prevented them from depicting what they knew to be the case, namely that objects rest on surfaces, they don't float above them. Well, against that backdrop, um, Annette Karmeloff-Smith, back in 1990, 
came up with a radical departure um, in the sense that she asked children not to draw a familiar object, um, a table, a cup, a house, an man, a horse. She said to them, I'd like you to draw something that doesn't exist. And to clarify what she meant by that, the children were given various um, uh, formula to help them pin down what she meant, such as a man you just invented or a pretend man, a man we'd never seen before. And the children were invited to draw um, a man that doesn't exist and in another part of the study, a house that doesn't exist. Uh, I'll, I'll focus for illustrative purposes on the man that doesn't exist. So what um, Annette Karmelov smith found was that many of the older children, by older, older children I mean eight to ten-year-olds, um, succeeded. So they inserted new elements into the schema for a man, such as an extra head. Here's um, a child called Guy, who's nine and a half, and you can see he's successfully <clears throat> created a man that doesn't exist. He has two heads and indeed he has uh, three legs. Another solution that children came up with was to take existing elements, but to move them around, to shift their location. Um, and here's Jesse again, nine and a half. Um, as, as you can see, Jesse's moved um, the head, um, the, one of the legs has moved to a shoulder and one of the arms has moved um, to become a leg, so to speak. And finally, some children mixed elements from different categories to create um, a hybrid. Um, here's Dominic again, nine and a half. Um, and as you can see, he's fused in a kind of centaur-like representation, um, a man and an animal, a man and a horse, perhaps. Okay, so the, I've given you illustrations from the older children. The younger children struggled with this task. They rarely produced these kinds of solutions. And here are the results. As you can see, the four to six-year-olds rarely produced um, insertions of an extra head, transpositions of arms and legs, or importations as in the, as in the centaur case. Thinking about this, uh, Carmela Smith argued that the problem that the children faced was in changing their routine drawing plan. So by the age <clears throat> of um, four or five, they may well know how to draw a man, um, and they do it um, in a re relatively routinized fashion. And she argued that the difficulty for them in drawing um, a man that doesn't exist was that they were then obliged to deviate from this familiar sequential routine. I think the evidence doesn't support that, the later evidence that was gathered doesn't support that interpretation. I think the problem is more profound and it's that the children can't imagine a man that doesn't exist in the first place. So it's not that they can't execute an impossible man, it's that they can't come up with what it would be like for there to be an impossible man that they could then go on to draw. So one way to decide between these two interpretations <clears throat> is to see what happens when children get um, an external prompt. So if children have problems in coming up with the idea of what an impossible man could look like, but don't have difficulty in executing it once they're given that hint or prompt, then they should do much better with the external prompt. On the other hand, even if we tell them what to draw, say, why don't you draw a man with two heads, we should still expect them to have difficulty if Annette Carmel Smith's interpretation is correct, because they would still have to alter their regular drawing routine. So there are several studies along these lines. I'm going to focus just on one by Bertie and Freeman. So they asked five and nine-year-olds 
to draw a man who doesn't exist. And in line with the original results, the five-year-olds um, mostly failed to do this, whereas the nine-year-olds mostly succeeded. So then Bertie and Freeman went back to the five-year-olds to see what would help them. And they divided the five-year-olds into two groups. Some were given a verbal prompt um, with no visual illustration. So they said, do you know how a drawing of a man who doesn't exist could be done? It could be done with two heads. Do you think you could do that? And in order to see whether um, yet a richer prompt was needed, the other half of the children were invited to shut their eyes and to try to imagine the picture of a man with two heads. As you'll see in a moment, um, both of these manipulations were more or less equally successful. So following either prompt, most of the five-year-olds, 76% now were successful in drawing an impossible man with similar rates across the two conditions. So um, as you can see with the prompt, <coughs> um, most children, two thirds are, um, sorry, with the, with the simple prompt, why didn't you draw a man with two heads? You can see that um, two thirds are now successful, slightly better if they're invited to shut their eyes um, with about 80% plus uh, solving the problem. So in other words, when we um, give the child um, a hint, a fairly, well, more than a hint, an explicit indication of what they might draw, it's not as if uh, they have uh, execution problems, they go on and execute the drawing. Some of you may have noticed, I think, that there are some intriguing parallels between the results for the drawing task and the results for the tool innovation task. They're both open-ended problems. They're both problems where it's up to the child, initially at least, uh, until the experimenter gives the prompt. It's up to the child to dream up, invent, or generate a solution in a relatively uncharted area to come up with the hook shape or to come up with the two-headed shape. And in both cases, we see that um, execution problems are minimal, whereas imagination problems are quite profound. So just to sum up then, drawing what does not exist is also rare in young children unless prompted. And as you see, my form of words here is to echo what I said about innovation and tool manufacture. So let me draw some conclusions then. Um, I've argued that young children's imagination tends to be guided by, to stick to everyday reality. Um, they generate imaginative possibilities based on what they've typically observed in reality. And this is not a bad thing. This reproductive imagination is good because it helps children to envision a plausible future rather than a fantastical or magical future. Um, nevertheless, there are important limitations um, because given their limited experience of what can happen, um, they underestimate the directions in which reality can go and they underestimate therefore what could happen in the future. They judge things that they've not seen to be impossible um, rather than simply improbable. At the same time, I've emphasized that children are very receptive to external prompts, um, suggesting that their difficulties with inventing a tool or drawing what does not exist are because they have difficulty in generating an idea rather than difficulty in executing uh, the idea once it's suggested to them. So this is a bit of a slogan simplification, but I'm implying that young children are excellent plagiarists, but poor creators. For those of you who would like to um, see this argument laid out in more detail, feel free to write to me. I have a paper in press on it. Let me just conclude with one final thought. 
about adults. And I'm now going back to that um, figure I showed you, especially the blue line, the, the fact that the adults were rather good at judging that um, an alligator could be found under the bed. In other words, they're rather good at recognizing that the improbable can occur. I'm tempted to say, and here I'm now can talk about contemporary events very briefly, that this may be an optimistic portrait in the sense that my guess is that there are <clears throat> extremely unlikely events that even adults are inclined to judge impossible. So to give one, um, some, one very contemporary um, illustration, if I had been asked a year ago um, whether um, it was uh, possible for the ISSBD conference in Rhodes to be cancelled, for flights between the United States and Europe to be mostly grounded, for millions of people to be out of work, um, and um, innumerable people to have died, and many people to be confined to their homes. I think if you'd have put that question to me, I would have been tempted to say that that was impossible. In other words, I don't think we adults <clears throat> have conquered the problem of being able to imagine what is unlikely, um, but nonetheless possible. And my guess is that there are important variations in cultures and individuals in their willingness to entertain um, the improbable. Let me stop there. Um, and I look forward to having questions. Um, and I believe um, they are to be submitted via chat. Tony, are you going to help me out here? Oh, Tony's currently muted. Uh, let's unmute her. Unmute her. Still muted, Tony. Maybe unmute your microphone. Sorry, I tried to unmute you, but maybe we both. There you go. Okay, got it. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. Um, thank you so much. I've always found children's imagination fascinating and always wondered, were we doing them a disservice to, to uh, somehow dampen that wonderful imagination they have? But okay, let me ask the question. <laughs> Tony, let, let me interrupt. That's precisely the position I'm disagreeing with. <laughs> so oh, good. Me, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it's not that children have a wonderful imagination. It's not that we dampen it. That's a trope that's very popular, but I disagree with it. But I, I won't elaborate on my criticism of that particular position. Uh, well, okay. And actually, that makes me feel better. Okay, let me, um, let me convey uh, some of the questions that uh, I see in the chat. So, uh, Julie Robinson asks, why do young children fear monsters in the closet or under the bed if their imagination is limited to memory of their own limited experience, drawing on what has happened to them in the past? Yes, it's a good question. So um, if you look back at some older work on children's fears, um, by Arthur Gersil, done in the 30s, the evidence is that actually three, four-year-olds um, are not afraid of monsters. The fear of imaginary creatures, impossible creatures, um, is something that we see in somewhat older children. And I also ought to emphasize in any case, of course, that um, children's imagination um, is also fed not just by reality, but by cultural input and the average six or seven year old will no doubt have been read storybooks that do include uh, monsters, uh, that do include princes that turn into frogs. Um, and even in um, um, the cross-cultural work, we see that occasionally children do come up with these fantastical possibilities. They pretend to be a monster, but I think What's happened in developmental psychology is that developmentalists have been seduced by the exotic and have paid insufficient attention to the more prosaic. And so we tend to have this overly 
in some sense, overly generous view of the richness of children's imagination. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Paul is wondering about children who live in, an, in the abstract world. Is it imagination or fantasy? Could you, I'm not quite sure what is meant by the abstract world here. Uh, well, I can't, I can't help because that's all it says. Um, I think the, cl the closest I could come to answering that would be, it would be important to think about perhaps children's understanding of infinity. I mean, some, my temptation would be to say that um, older children are capable of entertaining more abstract possibilities, um, such as infinity. Um, I doubt that younger children are capable of entertaining such possibilities. Another one that we might think about is whether children ever, ever start to think about the possibility that um, nothing might ever have existed. In other words, why is there, why is there something rather than nothing? I certainly remember thinking about that as a child at a certain point, but it wasn't when I was four or five, it was when I was, when I was older that I be began to think about that, you know, um, disquieting possibility that there might have been nothing rather than something. Um, okay. One person asks, how do these results relate to children's judgment of science fiction films or other forms of impossible fantasy? Well, I would guess that if we're talking about their judgment, um, that they would be quite good um, at judging what was what were the impossible aspects of a science fiction film. Um, that's what we would learn from the Stallman and Carey results, and ditto for fairy tales. So, insofar as something happens in a fairy tale which is impossible, I think children would judge that to be, correctly judge that to be impossible from a young age. And um, here again, I, you know, I disagree with some of the traditional work on this. So if you go back to Bettelheim's analysis of children's um, fascination with fairy tales, his inclination was to say, well, they're so confused about the way that reality works, um, that fairy tales seem like reality to them. And I think that's just radically wrong. I think children realize that these things can't ordinarily happen. There's also some recent interesting work, which I review in the paper that I mentioned, where children are given a story and invited to continue the story. And sometimes the story is fairly realistic. And sometimes the story is got some impossible elements in it. And what the investigators have found is that children um, typically continue a story um, in a more realistic mode. So, so actually they're not very genre sensitive. It's not as if they say to themselves, oh, this is, a, this is a magical fairy tale type story. I better continue in that way. Even more surprising, um, if you ask children what kinds of stories they like, there's no systematic evidence that they prefer stories with impossible elements in them. I mean, and, and again, I think that's surprising. We tend to assume because we, uh, you know, we know what children's literature is about, that it fits children's psychology. The implication of this work that it doesn't necessarily fit children's psychology. It's just, a, it's just an assumption um, that we make about children. And of course, you know, if we think about adults' interest in fiction, whilst um, science fiction um, and magical realism are possibilities, the dominant mode of fiction that we immerse ourselves in um, and, um, is, is realistic. Hmm. Okay. Um... Are there individual differences in possibility judgments? Some people think everything is possible. Were there any differences in the quality of drawings of a man with three heads between the Kamerlof and the bird studies? Um, 
to be honest, <clears throat> none of the studies I've mentioned focus very much on individual differences. So the Stuhlman and Carey uh, did not, if I think back, and I, I don't believe that the, um, the, the studies on drawings did so either. I mean, having said that, in the case of um, research more generally on children's drawings, we do know that there are relatively marked individual differences. Um, in particular, we know that there's a subgroup of children with autism who show unusual drawing abilities. Um, several well-studied case studies of uh, Stephen Wilshire was one, Nadia in the UK was another. Um, but as far as I know, none of these uh, children have been probed for their ability or lack of ability to uh, draw things that don't exist. And if anything, their talent is mostly predicated on their ability to do what younger children find um, have great difficulty in doing, namely to transpose a three-dimensional object onto a two-dimensional surface. That was certainly the, the talent that um, uh, Lorna Self showed in the context of Nadia, uh, an autistic ch child who draw, drew amazing horses with riders on top of them. And in her book about Nadia, you could compare what Nadia drew age seven with what a typically developing child would draw age seven. And there were, of course, remarkable differences, but they were <clears throat> remarkable differences in figurative abilities rather than in generative abilities. So, sorry, I'm not doing a very good job of <laughs> answering your question about individual differences in generativity. Well, let me, we have very little time left, so I'm gonna give you three questions quickly, but I should also say, that I'm skipping all the parts in the chat which say, thank you for a fantastic talk. I've learned a lot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but please people, please people, encourage those people to write for the paper. Where okay, I will. All their questions um, are answered. <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, let me tell you about three questions. Why do children fear darkness, loud noise, yet not tied to bad experience, if not out of their creative imagination? Children, uh, who have gone through trauma experiences become clean finds. They will not, for example, want to sleep alone. Please help me understand in relation to Im imagination. And then um, lastly, although there are many more after that, uh, my impression of this talk is children are quite reality prone as they mostly rely on prior experience or existing information. So my question is whether you can train their imagination by providing lots of fiction books, drawings, TV shows, especially these days when they watch so many children, when children watch so many videos. Should parents feed more information to help children remain more imaginative, which may have longitudinal effects? So it's a very different pick one or all three quickly. Okay, so to begin with the first one about um, loud noises, for example, um, I would say some of the most interesting analyses of those types of fears were conducted many years ago by John Bowlby. Um, and he pioneered, uh, amongst others, um, the study of, so to speak, um, prepared fears, biologically prepared fears, um, and loud noises, darkness, snakes, it's typically argued are fears that um, children can acquire very easily. But that's also true of other species. In other words, um, I think we don't really need to invoke the imagination to explain these fears. We do need to invoke um, biological preparedness. And to the extent that we see a cross species similarity, um, I think that undermines the need to invoke imagination. It's not as if the child is um, fearful of the dark because it affords a monster. The child is fearful of the dark, full stop, so to speak. And indeed, those fears can be attenuated, as Bowlby emphasized, by um, letting the child be accompanied um, by an attachment figure. Um, trauma, I wasn't quite sure what the thrust of the question was. Um, I would certainly 
emphasize though again that ch children who've been um, frightened or traumatized, uh, as Bobby would have emphasized, can certainly be reassured by being close to an attachment figure. Um, I wouldn't necessarily emphasize the fact that the attachment figure is in some sense constraining or, or dampening the child's imagination though. I would probably emphasize the fact that the attachment figure simply is a reassuring presence, is as it were inhibiting the arousal of anxiety in an otherwise um, threatening situation. And then finally, um, this is a nice question to end on, in fact. Yes, it is. What can be done to train the imagination? Um, I'm still thinking about this. Um, and I, so I give a preliminary um, answer. I think my answer would be that everyday experience, uh, but also cultural input is food for the child's imagination. So the child's being taken to a nearby city, visiting a museum. Um, I'm thinking of my own childhood. I grew up near Bath where I could go to visit Roman remains, um, but reading books. Um, so in other words, I think both first-hand experience and cultural input um, is going to enlarge the child's imagination. And it's worth emphasizing one feature of that um, developmental story. Let me just briefly shut the window. <laughs> Realities we're dealing with. Let's imagine the ocean, the waves out in the Mediterranean. <laughs> as opposed to the truck that's actually outside. <laughs> so I'm reminded of a wonderful study done in the 1930s by Margaret Mead. And she tested children, Manus children, um, gave, giving them various unlikely events, to, untoward events to think about and to explain them. And what she found was that these children rarely invoked supernatural possibilities. So they didn't talk about if a boat was suddenly found in the morning or a canoe was suddenly found in the morning to have slipped its moorings. These young children didn't start talking about witches. But she points out that on, among the adults, this was a very um, um, frequent strategy. The um, adult culture was rife with witchcraft beliefs. So there's a sense in which you can, if you like, raise a child such that cultural input will infect or enlarge, depending on which word you want to use, with alternative possibilities which don't necessarily exist. And of course, I'm here gesturing toward the possibility that children will be exposed not necessarily to teaching about witchcraft, but to teaching of a religious nature and so forth. So science, religion, um, history, fiction, all of these inputs expand the child's imagination, whether we want to approve of every, every direction of expansion is another matter. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Please imagine a wide, loud round of applause as I'm reading all these chat boxes that say, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I really thank you, appreciate Tony. it. Thank you.